Bonjour à tous, euh, et je m'appelle Cody Blois, euh, je suis le député de King Saints ici en Nouvelle-Écosse et merci d'être ici ce matin pour une annonce importante. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we have absolute incredible weather uh, and welcome to Hardwood Lands, welcome to Fraser Valley Farm. And I want to begin by recognizing that we are on Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I also, as I mentioned, wanted to recognize the fact that we're here at Fraser Valley Farm. This is a sixth generation dairy farm. Uh, and the Prime Minister had the opportunity to uh, say hello to Corey and Darlene Fraser and the entire family. Uh, to Corey and Darlene and to the entire family, thank you, you so much it? for yeah. allowing us to be here today uh, for a tremendous venue for a really important announcement. Je veux reconnaître mes collègues qui sont avec nous aujourd'hui. Uh, premièrement, le député de Halifax, Andy Still Fillmore, right yeah. le député de Dartmouth Coal Harbour, Dan Fisher, la députée de Halifax West, l'honorable collègue uh, Lina Metch Dieb, uh, le ministre responsable pour l'immigration, réfugiés et citoyenneté Canada et le député de Central Nova, Sean Fraser, et bien sûr notre invité de ce matin, le très honorable premier ministre. Prime Minister, thank you so much for being here in King's Hands, for being here in rural Nova Scotia, in Hardwood Lands. I, we went back through the history books and I'm, we're pretty sure there's never been a Prime Minister in Hardwood Lands, so uh, we're very excited to have you here today. You're, you're a lucky man indeed. I'd also like to recognize uh, Sid Peters, uh, who you'll hear from later. Uh, Sid is the chief of Gloose Cap First Nation. I'm, I'm very privileged to represent a riding that has uh, three tremendous First Nation communities, Sebag and Egety, uh, Gloose Cap First Nation, and and Annapolis Valley First Nation. And I know uh, Chief Gerald um, Tony is also here in the crowd somewhere as well, and representatives from Sebag and Egedy. So thank you, Sid, for your tremendous leadership, and I know we'll hear more from you in a moment. And also Sarah from S-Web. Uh, you see the, tur the turbines behind us. You see the work that they're doing in the community. I'll just simply say it's tremendous. I just want to say, uh, when I got elected in 2019, and sometimes there's a misnomer that people that care about climate change and care about renewable energy exist in urban Canada, and that rural Canada doesn't have the same feeling towards making important changes, and nothing could be farther from the truth. I remember being on the campaign in 2019, the number one issue I heard, we want a government that's focused on tackling climate change, on making investments in renewable energy, reducing emissions. Same thing, I mean, obviously COVID was a predominant issue in 2021 in the general election, but again, climate change, we want governments that are focused. And I'm so proud that we have the Prime Minister here today, along with my colleagues, uh, to be able to make a really important announcement that's going to matter to Nova Scotia. It's going to matter here in King's Hands. It's going to matter here in Harwood Lands. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over uh, to my colleague and to, of course, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Thank you. Merci, Cody, pour cette uh, introduction. This team, Cody, Sean, uh, Darren, Lena, never stops standing up for Nova Scotians. I want to begin by recognizing Chief Peters. Thank you, Sid, for being here, uh, and Sarah Rosenblatt. And a big shout out, of course, to Corey and Darlene for welcoming us to their beautiful farm. This province is known for a lot. Hospitality, stunning coasts, commitment, to the people around you, to neighbors, to community. Of course, the other thing you're known for is, frankly, those strong, gusty winds. Well, today, we're taking further steps to harness that power, to create jobs, to power homes, and to keep our air clean. I can announce that under conditional approval, we're investing about $255 million to build wind turbines and innovative battery storage projects across Nova Scotia. This is a huge step forward, and not just for the environment. Take the Red Spruce Wind Energy Project. It'll be here in East Hance, just over there actually, developed in partnership with Gloose Cap First Nation. The project will generate clean electricity and create good jobs. And that's just one of many in this investment. By harnessing Nova Scotian innovation and, yes, wind, we're creating over 500 middle-class jobs across the province, we're working in partnership with local First Nations communities, and we're delivering clean, 
made in Nova Scotia power to hundreds of thousands of homes. L'investissement dans l'énergie éolienne annonce aujourd'hui montre encore une fois que l'environnement et l'économie vont ensemble. On crée des emplois tout en luttant contre les changements climatiques. C'est une situation où tout le monde est gagnant. And as Cody pointed out, here uh, in uh, more rural parts of Canada, there is a deep understanding uh, that creating cleaner air, fresher water, protected uh, soils, sustainable practices is the only way to make sure that next generations on farms like this, but also across our country and cities, are going to have the kind of future we want for them. Rural Canadians have always been leaders in thinking about this, in pushing on this, and it's up to all of us to make sure we give the tools and investments that allow them to follow up on their big dreams. Of course, turbines are great for when the wind is blowing, but as it usually is, but what about days like today? How do we store all the energy they generate? The answer, of course, is batteries. As part of this investment, we're supporting construction of one of North America's largest battery systems right here in Nova Scotia. In fact, the turbines behind us helped power the pilot project leading to the development of these batteries. On investit à partir du captage de l'énergie éolienne jusqu'à son stockage et à sa distribution dans les foyers. Avec la Nouvelle-Écosse tous ensemble, on continue de bâtir un avenir propre. Here today, we're reminded that the solution to so many challenges our world faces is not what we don't have, but what we do have. Nova Scotia's got innovation, hard work, and a deep commitment to the world we're leaving for our kids. That's what will power our future. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Maintenant, très heureux de serrer la parole au ministre Fraser. Sean. Euh, bonjour tout le monde. Je suis très heureux d'être euh, ici avec vous euh, aujourd'hui pour célébrer une bonne annonce. Gwen euh, Nindawisi, Sean Fraser, well, dans ce qui est basé sur Gwen. My name is Sean Fraser. I'm the uh, Minister of Immigration, but uh, importantly today, also the Member of Parliament for Central Nova. Um, before I, I, I give a short synopsis of why this is important to my community, uh, let me just say how pleased I am to see so many people coming out. Uh, recognizing the importance of investing in green energy. Uh, we know that climate change is real and that we need to make necessary investments if we're going to transition to a green economy and to secure a healthy future for our kids and for our grandkids. The consequences are, are showing themselves year over year. We're familiar with storm surges and hurricanes on the East Coast. We've seen uh, floods and forest fires in Western Canada over the last number of years and heat waves in Ontario and Quebec that have dire consequences for people who live in our communities. The cost of not taking action on climate change uh, is too great to ignore. If you want to look at the crass economics of it, talk to the Insurance Bureau of Canada. They'll tell you from the time I was born until about the year 2000, the average value of insured losses in Canada ranged typically between 250 and 450 million dollars a year. The last number of years, it's about two billion dollars a year. Going forward, only five, ten years, we're looking at potentially five billion dollars in losses to severe weather events. I can't help but point out here uh, on a farm the importance of the lost opportunities with the changing climate for our agricultural sector is enormous. When we do have severe weather events, retail locations and downtown urban cores are also shut down. These costs are enormous to the Canadian economy and impact real people working in real communities and real jobs. But if we think not only about the need to take action to avoid these costs, we're going to quickly realize the economic opportunity of making investments like the Prime Minister just announced here in Nova Scotia. We have become one of the world's leading jurisdictions uh, in green technology. I think just about a month ago, uh, a, great, uh, a great announcement from Sustainable Marine for the first time has actually got uh, in-stream tidal energy generated in the Bay of Fundy on the grid here in Nova Scotia. I think about uh, the Global X Prize winner company uh, and uh, Dartmouth Coal Harbour, Darren Fisher, you'll know them well. Carbon Cure, who's sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and injecting it into concrete to make a stronger product that also provides a climate solution. We've got uh, a Graphite Innovation and Technologies, who's created a new paint for the holes of uh, vessels that can actually reduce the uh, fuel consumption by 20% uh, for, uh, for vessels in the ocean. This is incredible stuff, folks. 
we see in my own community, uh, in the town of Antigonet, seeking to become Canada's first net zero community. Prime Minister will have to have a chat about their funding ask to make that happen. Uh, but we also see research going on in our universities. In my own backyard at St. Evex University, uh, David Risk's Flux Lab has developed technology that allows them to detect uh, leaks in methane uh, infrastructure uh, right across the world by strapping a, a sensitive detector on the front of a truck. Supported by a fairly modest investment of the federal government, they are now working with major energy companies all over the world to reduce emissions and to create jobs in the meantime. What I see uh, today is an investment in the future of the economy of Nova Scotia, uh, both to prevent those costs of inaction, but to create jobs at home. This is more than a quarter billion dollars coming to green energy in Nova Scotia. And what you may not realize is that's created the conditions to unlock a total of more than a billion dollars towards the sustainable energy projects in Nova Scotia. I can't tell you how excited I am because of what it means for our community. We're going to have one of these projects near the border of Pictou County and Antigonish, the part of the world that I call home. And I just want to say thank you uh, to the Prime Minister uh, uh, for the, the faith that you've shown in Nova Scotia's green economy, but also for our partners, in particular uh, Chief Sid in your community is a phenomenal uh, leader when it comes to investing in green energy. I'm so thrilled to be here today and I'm so pleased to pass off uh, the microphone to Sarah who's going to share some more details about uh, what this project means for our communities. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Merci beaucoup. Good morning, and thank you for having us. As Prime Minister Trudeau noted, SWEB development has been fortunate enough to receive federal funding for two of our wind projects here in Nova Scotia. The value of the investment made by the federal government to advance renewable energies is immeasurable. With this funding, SWEB, along with our project partner, Gluescap First Nation, we are able to provide local economic benefits for our host communities and for the province. These communities are often rurally located and we are able to drive economic development across a number of disciplines and different industries. Apart from our host communities, our renewable energy projects are able to provide significant capacity building initiatives to various underrepresented groups throughout the province. This includes First Nations, African Nova Scotians, and women. Nova Scotia has one of the most carbon intensive electrical grids in Canada. The emissions offset by this project will be felt countrywide. To conclude, I would like to take a moment and acknowledge the hard work of my team members, as well as our project partner. We believe that the key to renewable energy development is local involvement and local engagement. With our community feed-in tariff project, Hardwood Lands, behind us in the background today, we look forward to the future for additional benefits for East Hance and for our other host communities. Thank you all again, and I will now hand things off to Chief Sydney Peters. Well, before I began, I, I think I'd just like to say, well, we talk about global warming, but today is a pretty awesome day, and I guess I shouldn't have this heavy jacket on, but I'll dress up for the Prime Minister, that's all. Um, so for some of you that don't know me, of course, I just wanted to say good morning, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, I am Chief Sid Peters, and I am from uh, Gloose Cap First Nation, as well as the co-chair of the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs. Um, on behalf of the Chiefs of Nova Scotia, I want to welcome you back to Mi'kmaq. As you know, the Mi'kmaq, of course, are the first peoples of this land. The lands, the waters, the resources have been critical to our way of life in years in the past and will continue to remain important for generations to come. Here in Nova Scotia, we have a covenant chain of treaties that have been recognized and affirmed by the highest courts in Canada. Our treaties are the foundations of what our ancestors wanted to see for our nation then, and they will continue to lead us to where we want to be in the future. Our peace and friendship treaties are built on cooperation, reconciliation, and mutual respect. Part of the treaty's relationship is being able to work together, nation to nation, so that we are all able to make advancement for the betterment of all. 
This of course includes the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, but also Nova Scotians and all Canadians. I was pleased to learn that you were coming to back to our territory to commit dollars for a renewable energy. The Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia have been working to lead and collaborate energy initiatives, especially ones that are focused on respectful, careful, and proper use of our resources and renewable energy sources. The protection and conservation of environment is very important to our people. We hear that from our community members. We state that at board meetings and as well as other meeting rooms and that we always is the priority for our people. When it comes to my home community of Gluscott First Nation, we have a mission of maintaining a sustainable community through our people for our people. We believe in being a well-balanced community, living according to the seven sacred teachings. We are committed to the next generations as we work to unity to become a forward-thinking, self-sustainable community. We honor our past and look forward to our future. We are proud First Nation, a community that strives to make connections with the world around us. I just also wanted to say it's, a, it's an honor uh, and considered to be a privilege to be working with our new partners, SWEB. We feel that the, the uh, organization has values and ethics and is community driven, similar as Gluscat First Nation. I also want to say and commend the other First Nations communities that has been awarded some contributions from the federal government. It's a great opportunity as Sarah has mentioned about capacity development, you know, and it's, it's like a dream come true. And as we mentioned that we hear it every day from our community members in board meetings, as well as just not First Nations, but how important renewable energy is to the life, 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 lifetime of our people and of our generations to come forward. As I mentioned, the Mi'kmaq people of these lands are always calling for Canada to balance resource development in energy production with protecting our environment, our health and sustainability. We're hoping that with today's funding announcement we will see a brighter and a greener future for Canada. Walalio and thank you. Thank you. Good morning everyone. We now have 20 minutes for questions from media. On a maintenant 20 minutes pour des questions des médias. One question, one follow-up. And we will start with the first question on the mic to my right. Good morning, Prime Minister. Michael Tutton, the Canadian Press. We had a, I'll take one extra question because we had a tiny little technical glitch for, for, for some Canadians. If you wouldn't mind just restating your important uh, announcement uh, for folks, uh, I think it's worth, worth hearing. Well, this is an investment that we're making uh, in the future of Nova Scotia by recognizing the work that has been done but needs to continue to be done on greening the grid here and in ensuring uh, good jobs and economic growth for everyone. Uh, the announcement today uh, is around uh, $255 million uh, in uh, new wind projects and in uh, storable uh, energy projects through uh, innovative battery solutions uh, done in partnership with Indigenous communities. Uh, we're very, very excited about the uh, hundreds of jobs that will be created, uh, the hundreds of thousands of homes uh, that will see more renewable energy uh, and how we're moving about building a stronger future for everyone. Thank you. And Prime Minister, uh, my, my first question is, there is um, tough things happening in Europe. Uh, Germany is worried about its supply of natural gas. It's looking to Canada and there are two potential liquefied natural gas projects here in Nova Scotia. However, as we're speaking today, there's also the climate issue. So what are your thoughts going forward about those two projects and whether Ottawa, in light of what's happened, might be rethinking them? First of all, uh, obviously, uh, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine uh, has changed so many different things. We're seeing uh, pressures globally around supply chains, around prices uh, as we come out of uh, COVID and come through COVID. Uh, we're seeing disruptions as well that are having direct impacts on people in Europe and in Canada and around the world. Uh, so yes, we are in a, a challenging time right now. Particularly at issue is Europe's continued reliance on Russian oil and gas uh, for their economy. 
Uh, obviously, that can't continue. Uh, because the uh, billions of dollars that is sent to Russia for its oil and gas is then used uh, to continue this illegal war against Ukrainians. Uh, but we need to therefore uh, look at how we're supporting uh, from other sources Europe in the short term, but also how we move off of oil and gas from Russia or from anywhere much quicker than before. So we're seeing it as sort of a double-barreled issue. In the short term, yes, uh, supply chains around the world are looking at how uh, we can deliver more oil and gas uh, to Europe in the immediate. But it's put more pressure to accelerate that transition that maybe we talked about a decade or two. Now we're talking about you know, a single decade. Um, to try and get off our tremendous reliance on fossil fuels in general. Uh, so that's where investments are happening, uh, why I've been speaking directly with Chancellor Schultz uh, over the past number of months uh, to look at how Canada can be a solution. And yes, there are things that we're trying to do in the very short term as we look at this coming winter and the challenges that uh, Germans are going to be facing uh, with Russia choosing to weaponize uh, the source of uh, gas and, uh, and oil for them. But in the medium term, we know that Canada, for example, is going to be a reliable, strong energy partner in the delivery of hydrogen, for example. Well, hydrogen infrastructure, infrastructure to liquefy and transport hydrogen, is very similar and indeed can be the same infrastructure that's used for liquefied natural gas. So even as we're looking at trying to get off fossil fuels, even as we're recognizing that natural gas, while being the cleanest of the three different fossil fuels, is still a fossil fuel. Knowing that we can invest in LNG infrastructure in the short term that will then be useful for hydrogen in the medium and long term means that we can meet both those short-term challenges and long-term challenges. So I will say that we are looking at a number of different proposals around that. I'm not going to speak to any specific ones here in Nova Scotia or elsewhere, uh, but know that that frame of what we can do in the immediate to counter, counsel, to counter uh, Russia's toxic impact while ensuring that that transition and transformation of our energy grid goes faster and cleaner. And that's where this announcement uh, of $255 million into renewable and a cleaner grid here in Nova Scotia is part of our approach to get where we need to go even faster. Thank you, Prime Minister. As a follow-up, another difficult part of the world, Afghanistan, um, such a contrast from the peaceful spot that we're standing in. Um, there are nearly 18,000 spots in the special immigration program that are now essentially taken. These are for Afghans who worked for Canada in that, in that war. Now, will Canada commit to expanding this program, even if it means taking in more than the originally promised 40,000 Afghan refugees? Obviously, Canadians uh, know how important it is to build a better future uh, for the Afghan people. Um, you know, Canadians from across the country, indeed many Nova Scotians, uh, stepped up uh, over the years uh, in our uh, military efforts to defend uh, the Afghan people, in our humanitarian investments, in our support. So the Taliban taking back control of Afghanistan is heartbreaking and Canadians want to continue to help which is why uh, we stepped up with a larger announcement than just about any other country in the world in committing to uh, over 40,000 uh, Afghans uh, coming to Canada uh, in, these, uh, in these difficult years that we're looking at right now. Um, the challenge of course is that there are millions of people in Afghanistan who are hoping for a better future. There are hundreds of thousands of people who would like to come to Canada. And we have to make sure that even as we are welcoming in um, you know, 40,000 and as Canadians are opening their homes and their communities to welcome uh, these refugees fleeing, many of whom have uh, links to Canada, direct uh, service to Canada over many difficult years, we're going to have to figure out how to step up and support 
people who remain in Afghanistan with humanitarian support, with investments, with the global community uh, that is extremely concerned, rightly, about the Taliban's sponsoring of terrorism around the world. But we have to make sure we are getting food and supplies and a future uh, to people in Afghanistan, even if the Taliban isn't. And it is a difficult issue, but I can tell you uh, that Canadians remain focused on trying to be uh, the country that everyone around the world knows us to be, which is there to support, thoughtful and generous about bringing people here, but understanding that investments there are also the way to go, and we're going to continue doing that. Next question. Yeah, hello. Just to follow up on Afghanistan, it's been roughly a year since the uh, uh, feds launched the uh, special program for Af uh, Afghan uh, immigrants. Um, and just looking back on a year since that program launched, what are the successes and failures of that program? Um, I'm going to turn to our Im immigration minister to speak uh, a little bit to that as well. But I can say that every situation is different around the world. You will remember. Uh, that we got elected back in 2015 with a commitment to bring in, in very short order, uh, 25,000 Syrian refugees. It was a, a clear moment where the world needed to step up, where uh, the previous Conservative government had simply not wanted to engage. And we saw Canadians from coast to coast to coast opening up their communities, their homes, wanting to do more. And I can say, seven years later, uh, that the Syrian Canadian community is doing extraordinarily well in contributing uh, in uh, small towns and big cities right across the country. It's one of those great, great stories. And yes, we very much want to do uh, similar things for Afghanistan with the 40,000 we've committed to, understanding, however, that the situation is very different. The challenge right now is actually getting people out of Afghanistan. Uh, which the Taliban is not allowing for. It's extremely difficult to even process people in country right now. So yes, we've brought in thousands uh, of uh, vulnerable people fleeing uh, from Afghanistan, many of whom came through uh, neighboring countries. Uh, but there's a lot more to do, and we're going to keep doing that. But uh, Sean, why don't you uh, take a couple of uh, uh, Certainly. Uh, look, uh, thank you for the question, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, that we're still receiving questions about uh, Afghanistan, despite uh, a lot of other enormous challenges uh, in the global situation today. I think it's important that Canadians don't uh, forget those who, who've helped us. Um, so your question uh, was really about the, the challenges and, and successes uh, involving the, uh, the mission of resettling uh, at least 40,000 uh, Afghan refugees. The challenges are really driven by um, situational factors on the ground, not by uh, government decisions along the way. Uh, just to put a finer point on the uh, argument the Prime Minister just outlined, what people don't appreciate is the global system of resettling refugees is designed to move people who've been displaced in many cases for a number of years, uh, who we have access to, who've been vetted by uh, global uh, agencies such, such as the UNHCR. Uh, after we formed government in 2015, a lot of people don't uh, conceptualize it this way, but the Syrian refugee resettlement effort uh, really took place three years after the war had begun. Uh, hundreds of thousands, likely millions of people had already fled, and we were dealing with uh, groups of people who, by and large, found uh, temporary safe haven uh, in refugee camps or, or in other uh, countries in the region. Um, what we had to do in that instance was identify people who were eligible to come to Canada, uh, fly airplanes over, and bring them to Canada. Uh, the difficulty was more on the resettlement side, finding communities who maybe didn't have the muscle memory because uh, for many years we didn't have such ambition when it came to resettling refugees. Of course, since then, uh, Canada has become the top destination in the world for the resettlement of refugees in each of the last number of years. And in 2020, we actually resettled one-third of the global total of refugees uh, that were resettled uh, anywhere. Uh, just to put a, uh, uh, to draw into focus uh, the, the contrast and the situation that we're dealing with in Afghanistan. Uh, we're dealing with a territory uh, that's been seized by the Taliban, uh, a listed terrorist entity under Canadian law. Uh, these are people who don't have interest uh, in helping people destined for Canada. They don't have interest in helping the Canadian government for reasons that are perhaps obvious. Even if they wanted to, uh, they don't have the expertise in how to uh, manage the flow of people or even operate uh, a professional airport. At every step of the way, the challenges in Afghanistan are much greater uh, than in other situations where we've been involved in, in resettlement. Uh, in particular, even when we have successes along the way in negotiating an agreement with Pakistan to let people destined for Canada uh, into that country for onward travel to Canada, 
we see a response from the Taliban where they indicate that they're going to close the border to these individuals unless they have an Afghan passport that's been issued by the Taliban. Uh, for reasons I'm sure you can appreciate, not many of the people who are fleeing persecution at the hands of the Taliban want to approach them for a passport so they can come to Canada. These are the challenges that we're dealing with on the ground and securing safe passage has been and remains the number one challenge to get people successfully resettled in Canada. Uh, despite these challenges, I can tell you there's hardly been a thing in my life I've been more proud of. I've met a lot of the people who live in our communities today. I was visiting Calgary a couple of months ago. A gentleman stopped me in the street and asked me, are you Sean Fraser? I had no idea how he'd recognize who I am. I mean, I'm six foot seven, maybe he can pick me out in the street. Um, he gave me a giant hug and said, I arrived two weeks ago. I just left quarantine because I wanted to follow the rules when I got to Canada. This is the first uh, time I've been out on the city, on Stephen Avenue in downtown. He said, uh, thank you, thank you to Canada, we're so grateful. Uh, we parted ways, and 90 seconds later, he came back running down the street with nine friends, all of whom were having their first social outing in Canada. The, the tears in that conversation were something I will never forget for the rest of my life. I went to the Pearson International Airport when we welcomed the cohort that included the 10,000th Afghan refugee he landed in Canada. And I saw families with kids the same age as my kids, who don't know the challenges that their parents were facing when they brought them to safety. But their parents were kissing the ground on the tarmac uh, when they finally uh, found safety in our country. So far, there's almost 17,000 human beings who are safe in Canada who've been given a second lease on life. Our commitment on a per capita basis is by far the largest in the world. On a raw numbers basis, we're one of the most substantial of any country in the world when it comes to Afghanistan. At the same time that we continue to have a global leading effort to help uh, Ukrainians who are fleeing this uh, unjust war of aggression. But one of the things that I think is important is we realize that the people who are coming here uh, we can't think of these people as charity cases. They arrive with a lot more than the contents of their suitcases. They want to give back. They want to work. And one of the most heartwarming things that I've seen is Afghan refugees who landed in Canada just a few short months ago are some of the first people to volunteer to help Ukrainians. And they tell me they want to do it because they understand what it's like to be fleeing war, violence, and persecution. And they understand what it's like to have a country put their hand up and say, we want to provide safe haven to you. And they want to be part of that for the next tranche of vulnerable people who are seeking safe haven. So from my perspective, sure we have work to do, sure challenges remain when it comes to securing safe passage for vulnerable Afghans, but when I look around the world, there's no question that Canada is leading the way when it comes to settling some of the world's most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Follow up? Yeah. Just bringing it back to issues of climate change, um, how are you going to be responding to issues of the climate crisis that we're already seeing, such as extreme heat and forest fires? We know we have to do more. Uh, we know uh, that investing in resilience, uh, investing uh, in new infrastructure, uh, working with partners across the country, municipalities and provinces, uh, to make sure that people are protected from the increasing impact of extreme weather events, whether it's forest fires or floods uh, or uh, you know, further challenges, we're going to continue to be there. Um, but part of making sure that we get there is being as aggressive as possible in not just uh, transforming our energy mix like we're doing with this announcement today, but modeling, demonstrating solutions and indeed providing those solutions to the world so they can do the same things. Listen, Canada is one of the top three uh, oil and gas producing company, countries in the world. But if we can demonstrate as we are that we can go greener, faster than many other countries. We're one of the you know, few countries that actually brought in a price on pollution right across the country and that had two elections where that uh, price on pollution was upheld. That's a clear indication that Canadians understand that it's not just important for the air, for the water, for future generations. It's important for our bottom line. It's important for food on our table. It's important for our economic growth to be innovative and leading the world on this. And that's what we've been doing. And that's what we're so excited about working with partners around the, around the country on. And it just boggles my mind that the Conservatives are having a debate over their leadership right now and they're still arguing about whether or not we need to move forward on the fight against climate change. There's very few people in this country who still think that you can have a plan for the economy without having a plan for the environment. 
And most of those people seem to be running for the conservative leadership. Next question. Good morning, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, so when we talk about uh, renewable energy for Nova Scotia, uh, the uh, an important and long talked about uh, as, uh, facet of that would be the uh, proposed Atlantic Loop project that would uh, take uh, clean energy uh, transmitted into Nova Scotia. Um, just wondering if there is uh, uh, any further information and if so, what that the uh, federal government needs to uh, needs to have before making a uh, a decision on. on. Uh, we know this is a real uh, issue and and a real desire by Nova Scotians and folks across Atlantic Canada uh, to reduce the reliance on uh, fossil fuel fuels, particularly on coal. Uh, we know as a country we've committed to phasing out coal. Uh, we have in Canada one of the cleanest electricity grids in the world, already up around 80% renewable, although there are regional variances, including here in Nova Scotia, where that number is far, far lower, uh, which on one hand is a challenge, but on the other hand is a tremendous opportunity. It means that projects uh, like these uh, make a real massive difference in shifting uh, our reliance off of fossil fuels, and we're going to continue investing in local projects like these. But yes, the Atlantic Loop remains a big uh, scale solution to this. Uh, I can tell you that uh, conversations are very active and ongoing. Uh, min uh, Minister LeBlanc, Minister Wilkinson continue to lead uh, on this issue, and we're very, very hopeful that we're going to be able to continue moving forward uh, because we need uh, a large scale solution in terms of uh, getting a, a fully 100% clean electricity grid across the country uh, by the 2030s. Uh, nous savons euh, que des projets locaux comme ceux qu'on est en train, dans lesquels on est en train d'investir, est extrêmement euh, important euh, pour euh, commencer à changer le, le, la proportion euh, d'énergie renouvelable qu'on retrouve en Nouvelle-Écosse, qui est de loin inférieure à la moyenne canadienne. Mais on sait aussi euh, que le loop de l'Atlantique va être une solution importante pour les années à venir, et c'est pour ça que le travail continue, les négociations, les discussions euh, continuent avec les différentes provinces, avec les premiers ministres des provinces, euh, pour qu'on puisse arriver à cette solution rapidement. Follow-up? Uh, yeah, so the Atlantic Loop project, uh, when given the OK, uh, will take several years to get up and running, uh, and we have a uh, firm target of 2030 to get off. Uh, Cool. I'm just wondering uh, how soon do you think this thing can get going and uh, how much uh, money is the federal government willing to uh, contribute? Well, uh, a lot of that is up to uh, the local Atlantic governments on how uh, willing they are to move forward. We're certainly going to be there as partners uh, on this as we've always been. But in the meantime, we can't just uh, wait for the Atlantic Loop. We need to be moving forward on significant energy investments like this one. Uh, that's going to power hundreds of thousands of homes with uh, clean electricity, uh, de de demonstrating uh, the partnerships with Indigenous communities, uh, demonstrating the private sector's uh, vision coming in with innovative solutions that are going to work for people. These are all things that uh, we need to work on at the same time. I know Nova Scotians are rightly proud of this extraordinary environment. Uh, we need to make sure we're uh, protecting it and supporting it so it can continue to provide for all of us uh, for years to come, and that's exactly what this announcement is about. Next question, please. Prime Minister, Hockey Canada said yesterday that it will no longer only use its National Equity Fund, which was built using revenue from minor hockey registration fees, to settle sexual assault claims. Are you satisfied with Hockey Canada's response? And if not, what more does it need to do to regain Canadians' trust? I think, I think uh, obviously, it's a, uh, it's a step in the right direction, but Hockey Canada needs to do an awful lot as an organization uh, to gain back the trust of Canadians. Uh, their behaviour over these past years, and indeed over these past months, uh, has been not worthy of an organization that uh, embodies so many hopes and dreams for young Canadians, uh, boys and girls, uh, for sport, for healthy living. So many parents uh, entrust their kids to these organi this organization and uh, organizations that flow from that. We need 
to see Hockey Canada demonstrating a level of transparency, accountability, understanding of the situation they're faced with. There needs to be a real reckoning uh, with the kind of behavior that we saw from that organization uh, and the willful blindness to something that uh, other organizations uh, have been faced with, struggled with, but made good decisions around uh, as opposed to what Hockey Canada has been doing. So I think there's a lot more that Hockey Canada is going to have to do uh, before Canadian parents like me uh, start trusting them. And we're seeing inflation at highs that we haven't seen in decades. And I know the child benefit uh, has increased, but wage increases for those who even get wage increases are far from infl inflation. Uh, so what can your government do to help you know, families, couples and individuals who are really struggling right now to make ends meet? Our focus has always been on helping those who most need the help. Uh, whether it was when we first got elected, one of the first things we did uh, was raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could lower them for the middle class. Then we move forward with the Canada Child Benefit that delivers hundreds of dollars a month tax-free to families that need it right across the country. And we did that by stopping sending the child benefit checks to millionaires that the Conservatives had sent so we could give more money that people actually needed. And the Canada Child Benefit actually has lifted over the past years hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty. It's part of the story that we got to tell uh, lift, that lifted a million Canadians out of poverty in our first mandate and uh, is continue to do that work. Just yesterday, the Canada Child Benefit increased again uh, to help people keep up with the cost of living. And on top of that, we're moving forward recognizing that families are facing such challenges with an initiative that is cutting childcare fees in half across Nova Scotia, across the country for all parents. That's thousands of dollars a year they're going to save uh, that will allow them not just to have reliable, high-quality childcare spaces so their kids can get the best start in school, best start in life, and get uh, women back into the workforce because we know uh, that it's women who face uh, the impossible choices between career or family, but it's also going to save uh, families thousands upon thousands of dollars uh, that will help with the rising costs we're facing. We've also stepped up on investments uh, in seniors, uh, supporting students uh, with uh, better facility to get financing and, and uh, repay their student loans and more grants. And we're going to continue to be investing in things that grow the economy, supports for our small businesses, supports for entrepreneurs, targeted investments in things that grow the economy is the best way to keep us on track and keep supporting Canadians as we see job growth return. You know, since February 2020, the United States has only recovered about 95% of the jobs they lost through the pandemic. Canada's recovered about 115% of the jobs lost. So our economic recovery is strong. We just have to make sure that the cost of living remains affordable for people. And that's why we're investing directly in supports for the people who need it most. Merci. On va prendre la dernière question, Adrien. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Um, Parlant de la question de la santé, qui est une préoccupation ici dans la région, les provinces ont du mal à faire face à la crise qui frappe les hôpitaux, les médecins notamment. Elles vous demandent d'augmenter les transferts en santé, pour beaucoup demandent sans condition. Est-ce que vous êtes prêt à vous engager là-dessus tout d'abord, nous reconnaissons que la pandémie a mis énormément de stress sur nos systèmes de santé. Et c'est pour ça, d'ailleurs, que le gouvernement fédéral a investi plus de 70 milliards de dollars de plus par-dessus nos transferts normaux pour aider les provinces à livrer pendant cette moment, ces moments de crise. Et ça continue. Ça fait euh, juste quelques semaines qu'on a annoncé un 2 milliards de plus à travers le pays euh, pour aider euh, avec euh, les, euh, les, les chirurgies euh, et les traitements qui ont été retardés euh, à cause de la, ou reportés à cause de la pandémie. Alors, nous allons continuer d'être là, mais soyons honnêtes aussi. Nos systèmes de santé faisait face à d'énormes difficultés structurelles, même avant la pandémie. Alors, quand on regarde le nombre de Canadiens qui ont besoin d'accéder à un médecin de famille, à qui ça fait des années qu'ils n'ont pas accès à un médecin de famille, les gens qui peinent à accéder à des services de santé mentaux, qui 
depuis des, des, des années font face à ces défis-là. Il y a des, des gens qui, euh, encore une fois, euh, attendent trop longtemps pour des chirurgies importantes. On a besoin, oui, d'investir plus, et le gouvernement fédéral va être plus là pour aider ces gens-là. Mais une des meilleures choses qu'on peut faire pour aider ces gens-là, c'est de s'assurer qu'il y a des résultats livrés par ces investissements supplémentaires. I think one of the things we've seen across the country is, yes, the pandemic put tremendous stress on healthcare systems across the country. Uh, and the federal government, of course, stepped up as we did for everyone. We promised to have people's backs through the pandemic, and we did. We invested over $70 billion in new extra money on top of our regular health care transfers in the health care systems to support health care through this pandemic. So we stepped up, and we're going to continue to step up. We just stepped up a few weeks ago with an announcement of $2 billion for provinces and territories to help them get rid of the backlogs of delayed surgeries and treatments because of the pandemic. But if we're going to be honest, the challenges faced by Canadians looking for health care aren't just since the pandemic, aren't just because of the pandemic. For years, far too many families have been trying to get a family doctor and still can't get a family doctor. For years, people who are finally putting up their hands and saying, I'm struggling with my mental health, I need help. And we've worked really hard to destigmatize it in great ways, and people are now asking for help, only be told, I know you're in crisis, but we can get you an appointment six months from now or two years from now. That's not good enough. These are challenges that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, certainly but that have origins in systems that haven't been able to keep up with the needs of Canadians. So yes, like we have been, the federal government will be there with more investments in health care. Absolutely, we're going to do our share. But we need to make sure that with the tax dollars we're flowing into provincial health systems, Canadians are seeing results that they're actually getting access to a family doctor, that they're getting a mental health appointment uh, within days or a week or two, that we're reducing the backlog of surgeries, that we're using newer technologies, that we're combining data from across the country to better understand what the issues are. These are things that I think all Canadians should expect of all their orders of government, that they deliver transparent results with the tax dollars, your tax dollars, we're putting into these systems. So yeah, we've had great conversations with the premiers on how to make sure that happens, and we'll continue those conversations. But we need to make sure that the health systems that have been so strained over the years actually deliver for Canadians who deserve the best health care in the world. Oui, en parlant d'obligation de résultats, euh, vous avez, votre annonce d'aujourd'hui, si j'ai bien compris, est conditionnée à plus de travail, à des approbations. Quand est-ce que les néo-écossais peuvent voir des éoliennes pousser grâce à cet argent fédéral? On est, on est très confiants euh, que euh, les accords qu'on est en train de signer vont aller de l'avant. Il y a eu des excellents partenariats avec les Premières Nations, avec euh, les investisseurs et les compagnies qui vont livrer. Euh, on, on sait que euh, ça va débloquer euh, très bientôt, euh, mais on voulait profiter de cette journée magnifique pour pouvoir annoncer à quel point on va de l'avant pour investir dans l'avenir des néo-écossais. Thank you, and that concludes today's press conference. Merci tout le monde. Merci beaucoup tout le monde.